The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Pentecost with APA Virginia staff. Thank you for joining us for our monthly webinar series, Your Hour with APA Virginia, sponsored by the Berkeley Group. I see we have some friends of APA joining us. Welcome, President Earl Anderson. Thanks for being with us today. I see my friend Ben Tripp from Salem. Thanks for being with us today. And I see a couple of our sponsors have joined us. Cody from STV. Thank you. I hope you all are enjoying your Monday lunch hour. Um, before we get started, I have a few announcements from the chapter. APA Virginia is starting its own mentor-mentee match program. Those interested in being a mentor or a mentee should contact our YPG chairs, Whitney Sokolowski and Cody Gray, by June 1st. This is a great opportunity for seasoned planners to help influence the future of planning in Virginia by providing support, knowledge, and guidance to young planners who are interested in growing personally and professionally through networking opportunities, objective feedback, and leadership advice. For more info, visit the Career Center at virginia.planning.org. And we will have networking opportunities in person at the 2018 and 2019 conference for those involved in the Mentor-Mentee Match program, just to keep that in mind. Um, early bird registration is now open for the 2018 annual conference, Mountains of Influence, at Winter Green Resort on July 22nd through the 25th. Students and planning commissioners can register at a very reduced rate of $50 by June 1st. After that, it goes up. So if you're a student or a planning commissioner, make sure you register by June 1st to get that reduced rate. We'd love to see you at Winter Green this summer. A draft schedule is available at apavirginia.com and has all the info on sessions, mobile tours, and receptions. We've got some really exciting things planned this year at Wintergreen, like a reception at Devil's Backbone. And we're bringing back the conference app this year that everyone loves so much, and you'll even have the ability to track your CM credits this year. So I'd like to give shout outs to all of our annual and conference sponsors whose support helped make the annual conference possible and help it be the premier learning and networking opportunity for planners in Virginia. Uh, thank you to DHCD, Housing Virginia, Tyler Technologies, GovSense, General Code, Michael Baker International, Clarion, Frazier Associates, James McGowan, DCR, US Census, Cypress Creek Renewables, Berkeley Group, Kimley Horn and Associates, Virginia Tech, Work Program Architects, EPR, and STV Inc. Thank you so much for supporting APA Virginia. For those of you who just signed on, thank you for joining us for our monthly webinar series, Your Hour with APA Virginia, sponsored by the Berkeley Group. We have a full house today. So thank you for those who share this with your colleagues and help spread the word about our series. Our webinars are the fourth Monday of each month from noon to 1 p.m., covering many topics in the planning arena. This month was moved up due to Memorial Day being next Monday. Hope everyone enjoys their three-day weekend. Uh, CM credit info will be available on apavirginia.com and in the follow-up email to this webinar, and we'll post the webinar to our YouTube page within 24 hours. Please mark your calendars for next month's webinar on June 25th. We'll have Olivia Devereaux with Devereaux Environmental Consulting, Inc. presenting using CAST to develop an environmental control plan for nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment. Visit apavirginia.com to sign up. Now say we have Andrew Painter presenting Rise of a Region, a development of history of Northern Virginia. Andrew is a native of Northern Virginia. He has cultivated a unique set of skills, knowledge, relationships, and expertise in the zoning and land use and transactional aspects of real estate law. He's represented clients in 16 Virginia localities from Arlington County to Winchester and specializes in securing zoning approvals and providing counsel to residential, commercial, and industrial developers and landowners. Prior to joining Walsh Colucci in 2007, Andrew worked for two members of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors, the County Administrator of Caroline County, Virginia, 
and former Virginia governor, now U.S. Senator Mark Warner. Andrew has frequently served as an adjunct professor in political science and urban history at the University of Richmond and University of Mary Washington. He is the author of a 2018 book chronicling the history of the Virginia wine industry, Virginia Wine, Four Centuries of Change, published by George Mason University Press and distributed by University of Virginia Press. So I will now hand it over to Andrew. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, um, and, and thank you all for 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 joining in uh, today. Um, my th this is a lecture that I prepared for the Engineers and Surveyors Institute. For those of you all who who do land development um, and you know entitlement work uh, up in Northern Virginia, um, th there's an organization, the Engineers and Surveyors Institute, um, and I, I I put this together for it to be a two-hour lecture, and um, so now. <laughs> Um, now I, you know, I have to sort of reduce it uh, to, to one hour. So I'm, I'm going to hopefully just sort of breeze through some of this stuff. But what attracted me to this was just the the, the history of, of this region. I mean, a lot of us living in the Commonwealth, you know, you know, if you don't live in Northern Virginia, kind of, you know, have trepidation coming up here because of the traffic or you know, just you know, just the, the cost of living or whatever it is. But you know, having grown up here in, in God's country, Northern Virginia, I really uh, I do take pride in, in what what we have created up here really in just about 60 years, turning this from a very rural area into uh, a dynamic economic development engine of the Commonwealth that, that can attract an Amazon headquarters or an Apple headquarters or, or whatever it might be. And I, I, I over the wishes of my wife, uh, my very patient wife, Mary Ann, I, I did put this lecture together. Um, and I was really attracted um, to it because of the history. And I think when I look at history, it's kind of like it's kind of like the story, it's the color, it's the narrative that kind of takes you somewhere. Um, and then there's also kind of the reason why, right? I mean, it's like the explanations. And I guess that's what history does. I mean, some of us are more into the analysis and, and not so fond of stories. Uh, and then some of us like stories and don't care for the analysis, you know, just give me the good juicy stuff. And I just think it's very important to put this region's story uh, into sort of a larger regional context about how we evolved. And as I put this lecture together, a couple of concepts sort of emerged. Um, one, this is a this is largely a story of growth constants. I think it's important to acknowledge that the pattern of growth in Northern Virginia uh, illustrates the vital importance of geographic proximity to the nation's capital and general economic conditions, uh, private sector decisions, and public policies in determining the pace and the nature of growth. Um, this is also another concept that emerged that this is largely a story of, of Fairfax County. We got you know we've got 95 counties in Virginia, uh, and the story of Northern Virginia has largely been one that has been driven by one county, and that's Fairfax, with adjacent jurisdictions being Loudoun or Prince William, all the way down to Spotsylvania, either seeking to mimic Fairfax County in terms of attracting quality development or passing policies meant to stem the tide of growth and not repeat what they believe are Fairfax County's mistakes or development patterns. Um, what's interesting is that Fairfax County in Northern Virginia, but Fairfax County in particular, its geographic borders necessarily meant that it had to absorb all of the growth emanating south and west from the district. First, first it was Arlington, obviously, because they were closer, but, but Arlington got tapped out, as we'll see in the 1960s. Uh, and this entire region had to be converted largely from a rural, count, you know, rural region to what you see today with, within, within five decades. Um, a third concept that sort of permeated was that this is, this is largely an incomplete story. Um, this is really just a one one hour summary, uh, but this is a story of large development and large infrastructure projects and, and battles. It's a story of changes to the physical landscape, and there's no way that I can touch on every personality or subdivision or highway fight. So I just want to highlight sort of the, the top flight stuff. Uh, and then last but not least, you know, this is largely a story without universal acceptance. For as prosperous of a region as this is, as successful as the schools have been and all the amenities that that that, that people think are up here. The decisions that have resulted in the changes to the built environment really have not been universally supported or accepted. It has really taken the dedication of individuals, be it developers or planning commissioners or county and city staffs or supervisors or community groups and anti-growth groups that really provide color to the story. So obviously everyone's advice to look beyond, you know, just what I'm saying here, look beyond the slides and 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 look after, you know, seek the factors that sort of give this story sort of sort of color. Um, so with that said, you know, let, let's sort of begin. Uh, this is intended to be sort of a brief exploration of the physical ways by which, you know, we've changed the land up here and the land has sort of changed us. Uh, why we have come here to live here, uh, why we have chosen to stay, uh, or why we've chosen to leave. 
Um, this is a region in which, you know, regionally, 2.8 million Virginians live. Uh, 1.1 million Virginians, roughly one in seven Virginia residents call Fairfax County home in particular. This is an increasingly diverse jurisdiction with people of color, and it hasn't always been that way. Um, but it's a, a, re a really remarkable place. And I want to start chronologically. Uh, we we'll start at the very beginning. And, and in many ways, the recorded history of, of, of this region is a reflection of the history of the entire United States. You have such familiar Northern Virginia names in places like George Washington and George Mason and Mount Vernon and Bull Run. Uh, even Washington Dulles International Airport, these have played or are playing and still playing important roles in the lives of Americans everywhere. Uh, this was, in the colonial period, obviously a southern landscape that was dominated by, by tobacco farms and plantations. Uh, you had the crown and parliament and colonial governments favor, favoring the establishment of settled places. And one of the most important factors in this growth, especially by the early 1700s, was the importance of tobacco. Uh, tobacco served as the main currency of Virginia, uh, including Northern Virginia residents. It has often been said that no particular crop has played a more important role in the story of a state or nation than did tobacco to young Virginia. And that's absolutely true. Uh, you had the tobacco inspection system being you know, established at these uh, river and road accessible hamlets, primarily along the Potomac rivers and the Occoquan rivers um, that, you know, they, they encouraged new roads and ferries uh, as planters sought the shortest route to get their tobacco to inspection and market. Um, eventually, of course, tobacco cultivation ruined the region's soil. Uh, it helped hasten an economic decline. Uh, but tobacco notes were used as the main form of monetary exchange for payment of debt and things like that. Uh, you had major commercial sites uh, popping up, again, along the Occoquan and the river uh, at the mouth of Great Hunting Creek um, that, that, that have these sort of uh, tobacco uh, warehouses where everybody's rolling their, their hogsheads of tobacco down. Uh, and in the natural progression of things, many of these small settlements grew into something greater. Uh, shown here is Dumfries, which was established by Scottish merchants who settled around tobacco warehouses in 1749. And for about 15 years from that point, Dumfries serves as a thriving port, which really rivals New York in terms of total shipping. Um, but one of the factors that brings its demise is the erosion and tiltation uh, along the creek. Ships could no longer enter the harbor for Dumfries. Uh, and you start seeing them go a little bit further up to the small village of Occoquan, which was originally an Indian settlement, which uh, in Algonquin means end of the water. And Occoquan, of course, what you see here is a city that's laid out or a town that's laid out at, at, at right angles. Uh, you have industries including tobacco warehouses and grist mills. Uh, but eventually, the Occoquan also silts up and could no longer provide access to ocean-going vessels. Uh, and you also have right across the uh, Occoquan, from the town of Occoquan, is the town of Colchester. Uh, this is a tobacco port town uh, that is located on the old post road, right down the road from George Mason's uh, home at Gunston Hall. Um, only one of Colchester's original buildings exists, which is shown in the uh, lower right-hand corner called Fairfax Arms. Um, but but like, like Occoquan, like Dumfries, is you start seeing the decline of the tobacco trade, the silting of the Occoquan River, and the diversion of most of the shipping up to Alexandria, and that causes all of these small, sort of small little riverfront uh, communities declines. Further inland, uh, you have uh, what became known as the, uh, the, the town of Leesburg. It settled in 1757 when you have tidewater planters moving into the area from the 1730s from the south and east. They established large farms and plantations, and many of the first families of Virginians, like the Carters and the Lees and the Masons, all had land holdings here. Uh, and the town of Leesburg gets started in 1757 around a sparse collection of buildings known as Nicholas Miner's Tavern, and later becomes the county seat and courthouse was built, and of course today it's the largest town by population in the Commonwealth. All of these little towns, though, don't hold a candle to the town of Alexandria. It's a bustling riverfront town. It settled in 1749, and it was about as far up the Potomac uh, as ocean-going ships were willing to venture. Uh, they go up to Georgetown, too, but Alexandria was far more prosperous. Um, its reliance, you know, if you take a look at the at grid, if any of you all have been to Old Town Alexandria, you know it is laid out on a right angle. Uh, the plan of Alexandria is virtually indistinguishable from many other early to mid 18th century towns in Virginia and in Maryland. Uh, remarkably, if we have anybody from, from, you know, from Fredericksburg, uh, the plan is very similar to the 1721 plan for, for Fredericksburg. And in both original plans, there are seven parallel streets uh, adjacent to the river uh, with three streets oriented uh, on the perpendicular. Uh, and of course, the, perhaps the most fascinating thing about Alexandria's original plan is sort of the hierarchical name of the East-West streets, like King and Duke and Prince and Princess streets. Uh, and of course, here's an image from 1836 and uh, what Old Town kind of looks like uh, today. 
uh, from around 1750 to the end of the um, uh, end of the 18th century, you have changes abounding in Northern Virginia's lifestyle and character. Uh, you have roads being built. Uh, you have uh, other forms of industry being increased. Uh, as tobacco fields spread, a number of older Indian paths become tobacco rolling roads, and you have names that are evolving from the practice of taking tobacco barrels uh, and hogsheads and rolling them down to wharves. And you see these streets dotting the maps of Northern Virginia today, like Rolling Road, which obviously was a colonial road built for the purpose of rolling hogsheads of tobacco, or Ox Road or West Ox Road, named for the beast that pulled those tobacco-laden carts along the road. Uh, you have forests being cleared for additional farmland. You also have slaveholding increases uh, increasing. 28% uh, of Northern Virginia's population owned slaves in 1748, but by 1800, 41% of the region's population owned slaves. Still, though, the region was largely a wilderness. It had few roads, little industry. The only wealth and commerce really came from the cultivation of tobacco and slave labor. And of course, historic relationships were altered at the end of the 1700s when the Commonwealth uh, ceased being a part of the British Empire and became a part of the new American nation as the 10th state. Northern Virginia would have largely remained a largely unexplored and unknown area, really backwoods, backwater, swampy marshland, especially along the Potomac, were it not for George Washington's choice of a site for the capital of the New Republic. Uh, shown here in the picture with Martha, he's laying out uh, his plan for, for the city that would eventually bear his name, the Federal District. He selected a 10 or 100 square mile area, uh, 10 miles on each side of land on property that bordered Maryland and Virginia. And in 1798, uh, land in the northeastern part of Fairfax County and parts of present-day uh, Arlington County and Alexandria City were ceded to the federal government as part of this new national capital. At the time, Alexandria was the courthouse, was the uh, county seat of Fairfax County. So just keep that in mind for a second. Uh, and what we'll eventually see is that in 1846, land that formerly belonged to Virginia uh, and was ceded into the District of Columbia was retroceded back to the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, it was not incorporated or reincorporated into Fairfax County. It would become known as Alexandria County, uh, but just keep that in the back of your mind as well. Uh, as the 1800s dawn, uh, it seems that Northern Virginia is on the verge of economic prosperity. It's got a brand new nation's capital located right next door. Uh, and in the decades after the American Revolution, you have large tobacco plantations that are, that are disappearing. Uh, more and more, and this is important to know, more and more, Northern Virginia becomes a producer for the growing population of D.C., servicing those needs, stock and poultry farms, flour milling, fruits and vegetables, but especially dairy. This becomes a center of dairy production serving the nation's capital all across Northern Virginia. You get new roads as well, most of which are built with private funds, and they bear names like Little River Turnpike, uh, which connects Alexandria and Aldi in, in Loudoun County. You get Leesburg Turnpike that goes from, uh, you know, Leesburg to Drains Tavern, now called Drainsville, where it meets up with the Falls Bridge Turnpike, which is today known as Georgetown Pike, uh, and that connects Drains Tavern to Georgetown. You get the Alexandria and Warrington Turnpike. And eventually, as the 1800s move on, you, you get a variety of railroads uh, coming through as, as, as well. This is the town of Providence. As I mentioned, uh, when the District of Columbia, uh, when we ceded uh, land to the District of Columbia, Fairfax County needed to move its courthouse out of Alexandria. And so uh, what is today known as the city of Fairfax really began as Fairfax Courthouse and the town of Providence in 1805. Uh, it's built around the courthouse uh, at the intersection of the Little River Turnpike and Ox Road. Uh, we now know where those names sort of come from. And, um, uh, you know, you start seeing sort of little communities pop up. But the years between about 1820 to 1840 actually are harsh ones. Uh, Northern Virginia soil has been depleted from the overplanting and overreliance on tobacco. Uh, the most prosperous economic region uh, of the or economic area of the region, Alexandria, is ceded to the federal government. It's no longer in Virginia. Uh, there's a population decline as well. But starting in the 1840s, the region's economic fortunes improve as you get people from the northeastern part of the nation moving to northern Virginia. Uh, they bring with them improved farming techniques, which allows them to better utilize land that was thought impoverished uh, by longtime county re residents. Uh, during the American Civil War, now we're in the middle of the 19th century, troops from both sides crisscross the county. They wreak havoc and destruction on private property. Uh, this region sees two major battles. Uh, first and Second Manassas, uh, which takes place in 1861 and 1862 uh, on the Fairfax Pro, uh, Prince William line. 
Uh, and then the Battle of Chantilly or the Battle of Ox Hill, depending on which side uh, you, you favor, which was fought in September 1862 at nighttime in a blinding thunderstorm, hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, with cavalry and infantry. Um, but the war, the, the Civil War, greatly disrupted commercial activities in the region. Both sides seized railroads, they seized businesses and raided farms. And you can just imagine destitute white and African-American residents wandering around on rural roads, uh, almost like a scene out, out of the end of World War I or World War II with discarded military hardware. Uh, but once the war came to an end in April 16, uh, 1865, uh, the economic rebuilding of the region happened very quickly. Uh, of course, the traditional antebellum lifestyle of the Civil War never returned. It was dead. It was over. And you start seeing, again, the reemergence of dairy and stock and poultry farming. Uh, and truck farms become important as well. Schools and churches are functioning again. Uh, and in 1870, Virginia is readmitted to the Union. Uh, the railroad plays a prominent role in establishing towns, such as Clifton, uh, shown here, uh, which is in Fairfax County. Only about 160 people live there to this day because of zoning decisions we'll talk about later. It's really a remarkable uh, community. Uh, the town of Manassas, originally founded as Manassas Junction, is, is laid out in 1873. Uh, the town of Herndon, uh, the coming of the railroad in 1850 spurs Herndon, uh, spurs Herndon's uh, development. Uh, the railroad defines the town with dairy farms located all around. Uh, Herndon and Percival, but particularly Herndon, become a massive dairy uh, production center. Uh, East Falls Church uh, becomes a, a railroad hub as well. Uh, this is a picture of Arlington County because now we are moving into the early 1900s. The 20th century uh, was a time of great growth in this country, especially in our cities. And the same was true in Northern Virginia, which boasted numerous small towns and crossroads that dotted the countryside. Um, and most of the suburban growth that's going to take place in this time period in the early 1900s for the first three decades of the 20th century takes place in Alexandria County. Uh, obviously, um, uh, they are the first ones as you come south and west from the District of Columbia. And at the turn of the century, Alexandria County is still primarily rural. Um, the most prosperous uh, economic engine of Northern Virginia is located at the southern tip of the county, shown in green at Alexandria, which became an independent city in 1870. Alexandria County would later change its name to Arlington County in 1920 to honor the home of Robert E. Lee and, uh, and the Custis family, uh, which is now incorporated into Arlington, Arlington County Cemetery. But throughout the first 30 years of the 20th century, Arlington would develop its own economy, spurred on by steady population increases and the growth of very small villages and rural hamlets. Uh, several of the names that we now know of, like Boston and, and Clarendon and, and Roslyn Farm, had grown up along the county's roads. Clarendon, shown here, becomes the main commercial downtown of the county. You also get a place like Del Rey at Alexandria, which booms between 1900 and, and 1930. Uh, there are a series of trolley lines as well, which, which cut through parts of Northern Virginia and makes it easy for workers in Washington to live in Northern Virginia. Uh, and you see Arlington's population uh, just booming. You also see growth uh, and great expansion in the federal government and employment uh, during World War I uh, as well. You see railroads pop up too. Uh, the Washington Old Dominion uh, Railroad uh, goes uh, between Bluemont out in western Loudoun all the way into what is today Sherlington. Um, you get uh, a railroad like the Great Falls and Old Dominion Railroad, which is established in 1906. It's an electrified railroad that runs between Georgetown and Great Falls Park. And the owners of the rail railroad, uh, including John McLean, lend their names to some of the stations like McLean. Uh, and eventually this railroad would be abandoned and turned into what is today known as Old Dominion Drive. I want to highlight again dairy uh, farming. In the early 1900s, especially during World War I, the demand for dairy products goes through the roof. And from the 1920s to the 1950s, Fairfax County leads all other Virginia counties in dairy products. Uh, the average milk production of the county's cows is more than twice the national average. Uh, Herndon and Percival again developed into this hub of dairy farming. Uh, and you have Sadie, uh, who's the cow that's shown in the upper uh, left-hand corner. Here she is uh, pictured after returning from her triumphant visit to the state fair uh, in 1924. She was said to be the best-known Holstein in the world uh, because of her record production of 30 tons of milk and one ton of butter in three years. Uh, pretty remarkable. We see the, the truck photo, uh, the milk truck photo here as well, again, publicizing Fairfax County's leadership in dairy herds in the 1950s. Here's a picture of downtown Herndon. Uh, notice the milk jugs being being pulled. This is like a Courier and Ives uh, scene here, but notice the milk jugs. And you can see them in the upper left or upper right hand corner here at the along the Washington Old Dominion Railroad. Again, the milk jugs just waiting to be taken into the District of Columbia. Uh, here's the town of Providence, uh, which became the city of Fairfax uh, later on. But you can sort of see 
you know, aside from Alexandria and things that are going on in Arlington, the vast majority of Northern Virginia remains uh, rural. Uh, bad roads uh, are part of the problem. Northern Virginia was infamous nationally for the condition of its roads. Uh, narrow and unpaved, they were impassable after a heavy rain, and even in the best weather, you had horse-drawn wagons and motor vehicles that had a difficult time navigating the, the sort of the, the rutted byways. But now things are going to change. Uh, our region's history from 1930 to the present can be summarized in one word, and that word is growth. Uh, during this time period, this region literally exploded, and what brought Northern Virginia into the modern era was the dramatic growth of the federal government with the inauguration of Franklin Del Delano Roosevelt in 1933. Uh, with his election come increases in federal programs to respond to the Great Depression, and concurrently with those increases come additional employees needed to administer the new programs. Uh, so you have people moving to Northern Virginia from all parts of the country to work for the federal government across the river. And since the automobile uh, you know, provides increased mobility, and since Northern Virginia offers a less hectic lifestyle than downtown DC, it became inevitable that the new federal bureaucrats would be anxious to call this area home. Uh, there was significant federal uh, wartime spending and De Great Depression spending a couple of the highlights include National Airport, which opened in 1941. It was located on the Virginia side of the Potomac because it happened to be closer to the White House, which is an easier trip for President Roosevelt, who was disabled from polio. Uh, you also get uh, Fort Belvoir, which was founded as Camp Humphreys during World War I. And, you know, for those of you who work in jurisdiction with military bases, um, you know, it's very easy to forget that, that they are homes to jobs and home to, to a lot of people. Uh, today, Fort uh, Camp Humphreys is now Fort Belvoir. It serves as the headquarters for several agencies and about 51,000 jobs uh, and 7,100 residents. And of course, you have the Pentagon, which opens in 1943 in the middle of World War II. It's located in Northern Virginia, so it has easy access to Dulles Airport. And you start seeing defense contractors, especially after World War II, sort of walking their way down Route 7 and ultimately towards uh, what became known as Dulles Airport. Uh, along with uh, the Pentagon comes a Pentagon road network. Uh, which loops all around uh, this, 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 this massive uh, building, the largest office building in the world. And you get a series of new uh, roadways in the early 1900s because now the transportation of people and things is relying on the automobile. Arlington County recognizes this. Um, and uh, they were one of two counties, along with Henrico, which reject the Bird Road Act um, you know, and does not place its local roads in the state's secondary system of highways. Arlington believed, like Henrico, that it could maintain the county's local roads better than itself. So um, it, it, it decided to, uh, to reject the Bird Road Act. The main historic roads at this point in time emanating from D.C. going east to west are, are, are Lee Highway and Wilson Boulevard and Columbia Pike. And then the main north-south artery, of course, is Route 1. And that's about it. Um, but you start seeing the very first major development in new highways being built between 1929 and 1972, and that's the GW Parkway, uh, shown here. Uh, this is the first modern motorway built by the federal government. Uh, you have trees being purposely planted to enhance the beauty of the road with vistas and pull-offs being incorporated. Uh, those who have driven up here know that the northern sections, which were completed in the 1950s and 1960s, are considered masterful examples of parkway design, uh, which is pretty remarkable. Arlington County also realized by 1930 that a modern, centrally located east-west corridor was needed to handle automobile traffic through Arlington County to Falls Church, between Fort Myer and Falls Church. Um, and so what they constructed by 1938 was a new road called Lee Boulevard, uh, and it would connect what is, what's shown here in the green, Arlington, what is now Arlington National Cemetery, out to Falls Church, where it would link back in with the Red Road, which is Lee Highway. Uh, eventually, and comes as no surprise, it becomes a popular commuting route. Uh, and then in the 1950s, uh, or by 1950, Route 50 is extended all the way to what is now known as Fairfax Circle. It gets renamed from Lee Boulevard to Arlington Boulevard just to eliminate confusion between Lee Highway and, um, uh, and, and, and uh, Lee Boulevard. Uh, here's a picture of, of Lee Boulevard uh, in the 1930s, and then you can see what it looked like 20 years later. Massive commuting corridor, uh, and it still is uh, to this day. Shirley Highway. Uh, this is constructed in 1941. It's a wartime measure to relieve congestion for the thousands of government workers. Uh, it offers an alternative to Route 1, but it's constructed between Woodbridge on the Occoquan and the 14th Street Bridge. And here's a picture of it uh, being constructed in the upper left-hand corner, and the bottom right-hand corner is looking north at Sherlington uh, Circle there. And of course, uh, new multifamily projects are being built to house the new residents. Uh, and you have new businesses that are uh, being open to service them. 
Uh, you have Park Fairfax, which opens along Shirley Highway in Arlington County in 1942. It's about 1,600 uh, homes built by the federal government. Uh, you have Fairlington, uh, which opens up a couple of years later. That's 3,400 garden apartment complexes to house defense workers and their families during World War II. Sherlington Village opens in 1944 as the first large shopping center to open in the D.C. suburbs. It steadily expands uh, until changing shopping patterns uh, you know, start encouraging people to move away in the 1960s. Uh, Sherlington would be rehabilitated in the 1980s, and instead of turning it into a mall, developers and planners sought to turn it into a main street, and it was renamed the Village of Sherlington by the end of the 1980s, and it's been uh, fairly successful as well. So when we look back on the, sort of the first four decades of growth through World War II, you can see in blue, Arlington County leads the way. Um, it is a story of growth of Arlington by and large. Uh, not, you know, things are happening, trickling up in Fairfax County. We actually see a decrease uh, in Loudoun County's population, and, and Prince William is barely above, you know, 15,000 uh, people. And then we move into the 1950s in the post-war era. You have veterans coming home. You have wartime energy shifting to peacetime tasks. And the federal government keeps expanding to meet the jobs of veterans, many of whom decide to stay in the area. Uh, they're pressured to uh, provide new roads and housing and services and everything mounts. But we're basically all going out to the suburbs, and everyone who uh, can is, is going along for the ride. Uh, and I will talk in a second about racial deed restriction covenants. This move out to the suburbs was not open to all, and it has uh, changes. It has uh, impacts on 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 settlement patterns as well. But by and large, this is the, the, the flight to suburbia. And the story after World War II, if Arlington was the story before World War II, the story after World War II is Fairfax County. Um, it becomes the site of a major boom uh, of low cost, small, single family homes. There is a new Veterans Administration Loan Guarantee Program geared towards getting ex-GIs and their new family who want a yard for the kids and breathing space and, and, and just live in peace. Uh, but this is the beginning of the spectacular growth of Northern Virginia over the past century. Uh, by the 1950s, suburban development is changing the outskirts of Falls Church, uh, which is shown here. If any of you guys have been to the State Theater, it's shown in the bottom left-hand corner. As you sort of zoom out and look towards the top, you can see actually my neighborhood and, and the early growth suburbs uh, of Falls Church. Uh, you can see Annandale, uh, which starts, uh, you know, growth is emanating down Columbia Pike uh, and hitting Annandale. Uh, or McLean, uh, again, and tract housing. Uh, Ant-like conformity, as The Onion uh, once said, if any of you guys know The Onion. Springfield is one of the best known and perhaps the most successful responses to Fairfax County's population growth in World War II. It remained a large rural crossroads, which is what's shown in the upper left-hand corner, uh, up until the 1940s. And in 1946, uh, realtor Edward Carr subdivided the area, believing Springfield to be the last easily accessible tract uh, within 12 miles of the district. I mean, surely nobody would want to live, you know, 12 miles away. I mean, this is the end of the, you know, end of the road, right? Uh, but over time, uh, the unique combination of transportation facilities allows Springfield to sprout a central business district. Uh, it is flanked by industrial parks to the north and to the south. You've got the USG or the GSA 70 acre storage depot to the south as well. And this is a quintessential type of subdivision that you start seeing uh, pop up as well. Uh, Pimmett Hills in the 1950s, about 1600 homes. Uh, you get Bellevue on the south side of Alexandria, what's today south side of the Beltway, uh, popping up to 980 apartments on 56 acres. If any of you guys have heard of Lake Barcroft, uh, it's, it's a lake that's created in 1915 by placing a dam across Holmes Run. It's operated uh, by the Alexandria Water Company to provide a reservoir to Alexandria. But by 1950, the water company's needs exceeded its supply. So uh, it sold the reservoir and about 680 acres of land to a group of New England developers who basically create a community of miniature country estates around the lake. Uh, and if you go there today, it's one of the most sought after addresses uh, inside the Beltway. Uh, homes Run Acres, 350 homes between Falls Church and Annandale uh, with modern architectural designs in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, Holland Hills is one exception to sort of the monotonous pattern of subdivisions, 463 homes. Uh, this is the first major moderately priced subdivision of architect designed single family homes with flat roofs and linear designs and expansive walls of, of glass. Uh, Manassas Park, uh, 1955, uh, the first of a thousand homes uh, is, is built on the old breeding farm outside of Manassas. Uh, and, you know, Manassas achieves town status in 1957. It becomes Virginia's youngest incorporated city in 1955. 
As more and more people move into Northern Virginia in the 1950s, their need for goods and services grow, of course. You have new commercial facilities uh, uh, that are adopting to the styles that cater to shoppers that are now driving automobiles. Uh, and few could have seen at the time how greatly these sort of regional shopping malls would reduce suburban Northern Virginia's dependence on downtown retail stores. I mean, like every city, D.C. used to boast a, a, a thriving downtown retail uh, market. But by the 1960s, every major downtown department store established branches in Northern Virginia. And it converts Northern Virginia from just being a bedroom community to really being a satellite of the capital city. Uh, but we all know what they look like with their sprawling asphalt parking lots. These suburban hives really cater to the car-centric shopper. They sound the death knell to downtown retail districts. And in 1951, what is shown here, Parkington opens up. This is the largest suburban retail space on the East Coast when it opens. It's the first shopping center to be built around a parking garage. The name is a combination of parking and Arlington, or Parkington, uh, but it offers centralized indoor space, which is, of course, an anomaly that we now kind of take for granted. It's anchored by a Hex department store. Uh, and this would be renovated in 1984 under the name Boston Common Mall, and it is now being redeveloped again as Boston Quarter. Five years later, 1956, Northern Virginia's first regional shopping mall that is designed to serve a market of up to 50,000 people at Seven Corners opens up. And the project includes modernized highway upgrades that are today antiquated and in need of replacement, but back then it was a super highway. Um, it becomes the prototype for other centers that follow in the 1960s and 1970s. And it would be a mistake to think that all this growth is occurring uniformly across Northern Virginia. As the rural character of Northern Virginia is being replaced by urban development, you still have farming becoming, becoming or being an exceptional activity that is successful only when it is carried out on a large scale with machinery. And shown here is Sunset Hills Farm, uh, which later becomes Reston. Uh, you also have a series of small uh, crossroads communities uh, such as Centerville and Annandale and Colvin Run and Tyson's Corner. All of these are little you know, crossroads uh, and they're kind of all vanishing uh, by the 1950s and 1960s. And as we enter the 1960s, you have most of the growth being, again, occurring largely but not exclusively in Fairfax County. You have the suburban areas of Arlington and, and Alexandria were almost fully developed. And Fairfax and the neighboring Maryland counties of Prince George's and Montgomery are now absorbing uh, most of the rapidly growing areas in the region. And I want to put this in perspective. Between 1950 and 1960, Fairfax County's population triples in one 10-year period, triple-digit growth year over year. One 10 year period, it grows between 1950 at 98,000 people to 1960 to 249,000 people in one 10 year period. Massive growth. A lot of growth continues because of government expansion and decentralization throughout the 1950s. Uh, the Pentagon basically creates a march of agencies to the suburbs. The CIA uh, opens up in 1961. You have Nike missile sites uh, located across uh, these defense installations in Burke and Great Falls and Wharton to protect us from the uh, evil communists. Um, and then the biggest investment, of course, occurs in 1962 when the Federal Aviation Administration opens Dulles International Airport on about 1,700 or 17,500 acres of land in Chantilly. And this was a site that was chosen after seven years of opposition uh, from residents in Burke, uh, the Burke area of Fairfax County, where the FAA had announced plans to construct an airport in 1951. It boasts a, a terminal that is meant for the jet age. It's, it's definitely an architectural marvel uh, designed by Ira Serenin. Uh, but I wanted to show this picture because it shows you the massive amount of land uh, and the flatness of the land in this glacial lake bed uh, of what is today Dulles Airport. It was largely seen a white elephant for many years, but its importance was realized in the 80s and 90s when, uh, when United Airlines made Dulles one of its four domestic hubs in, 88, uh, in 1988. Uh, today, it accounts for about 25,000 jobs, and alongside this fancy new airport are a couple of other bells and whistles, which would play a prominent role in the development of Northern Virginia. The first is the Dulles Access Road. This is a new 13 uh, and a half mile access road between the airport and the Beltway. Uh, and then you also get the extension of Route 28 north from Centerville on the east side of the highway uh, going up to Route 7. Fairfax County is growing. It opens up a new uh, office building, countywide office building called the Massey Building in 1969. And then one new major center of growth uh, occurs in, outside of Herndon in western Fairfax County on the Sunset Hills Farm. Uh, this is uh, called Reston. Uh, it is uh, Robert E. Simon sells Carnegie Hall. He moves down, buys the A. Smith Bowman Farm, about 6,200 acres. He takes his initials, Robert E. Simon, R-E-S. He applies the English suffix for town or ton and creates the name Reston. And for many years, it was seen as a hippie commune. Uh, no one had mixed uh, land uses like uh, industrial and commercial and residential all in one place. It was the first uh, community 
uh, to propose the mixing of land uses uh, in this uh, region. And it was also a time when much of the new development in Virginia was under uh, racial deed restriction covenant, saying you can't sell to this person uh, or that person. Uh, but it was a mixture of different land uses with a main town center that he wanted to build, uh, which was going to be a sort of a Manhattan-esque landscape surrounded by um, uh, uh, rural farms and things like that. Uh, several village centers were supposed to dot uh, uh, Reston. They do exist today. The most successful in the original one was, was Lake Ann, which is shown here in Washington Plaza. Uh, it is now listed on the National Register of Historic Places, uh, but this opened up in 1966. And this gives a good view of the Reston Center for Industry and Government, uh, which is the area right along the Dulles Access Road uh, in Reston that is going to be home uh, to multiple research and development companies and, uh, and trade associations as well. Other communities sprout up. Uh, Kings Park West along Braddock Road, when it opened right outside the Beltway, that was seen as being the end of the line for Braddock Road. But you can sort of see the street pattern, the types of homes that, that you see dotting all across Northern Virginia, early parts of Chesterfield and Henrico County or parts of Princess Anne County, which is now Virginia Beach, have similar type homes. Uh, and then Tyson's Corner. This is a rural crossroads at the intersection of two historic highways. It evolves by the 1970s into the downtown of Northern Virginia uh, with shopping malls and businesses. Um, you have a series of car dealerships as well that make a retreat out of Arlington uh, because they need to go to open land and they end up locating right along Route 7 uh, as well. And now with the redevelopment of Tyson's, they're, they're looking further afield uh, too because they're getting pushed out too. Um, a lot of things change and here's Tyson's Corner in 1970. A lot of things change in 1968 when Ted Lerner completes his development uh, known as Tyson's Corner Center. Uh, and Tyson's Corner Center draws national attention to Northern Virginia. Uh, the first ever Apple store opens in 2001. It's one of the first super regional malls uh, in the country. Uh, and then you also have West Park, uh, which opens in 1962. It's 36 buildings and 3 million square feet on 600 acres. Uh, just a massive amount of research and development and office space. I mean, uh, most regions would kill to have, have something like that. Uh, but Tyson's Corner, back to that, today the mall has 2.1 2, uh, million square feet of retail. It's got three levels, 16 movie screens, nearly 300 stores. Uh, and in 2013, Tyson's Corner Center was assessed for $1 billion, uh, making it by far the most valuable property in the metropolitan area and the only property in the Commonwealth of Virginia to be uh, worth over a billion dollars, at least assessed for over a billion dollars. Uh, and this is kind of what the mall looks like today, a highly successful mall. Uh, and as part of the uh, Envisioning Tyson's Future plan, uh, there has been new development that has taken place um, uh, that have been added to sort of the fashion court uh, if you've gone up there. Now, this is not to say that, Arling you know, that, that Arlington and Alexandria have kind of been left out of the equation, that everything's occurring in Fairfax. It's not. Arlington's still booming during this period, uh, during the 1950s and 60s. You see it in Roslyn. Um, when, when you have civil rights unrest in the 1960s, it spurs white flight from downtown D.C. for businesses and government agencies that are looking for office space close to the Capitol. Uh, until this point, Roslyn was really just sort of a low-flung area of, uh, of, of light industrial buildings and car lots and pawnbrokers. But between 1960 and 1967, Roslyn's skyline just booms. Uh, it just changes uh, and creates sort of the skyline that you see today, kind of the mini Manhattan of the D.C. Um, uh, DC skyline. Uh, next national airport, also in Arlington during the 1960s, Robert Smith plans the first apartment building of what would be called Crystal City. And a bit of trivia, the name for Crystal City comes from the first building, the first apartment building called Crystal House, which had an elaborate crystal chandelier. And every subsequent building took on the name, you know, Crystal, Crystal Gateway, Crystal's Towers, and eventually the, sort of the whole, the whole neighborhood. Uh, alongside all of these new things, newcomers were very much pioneers. Um, you needed to create amenities. Fairfax Hospital opens up uh, in 1961. Uh, you get the establishment of regional, uh, the Northern Virginia Regional Park Authority, uh, which is very, very important. It's created by Fairfax in Arlington and the city of Falls Church to preserve drink, drinking water resource and provide passive recreation. Uh, the WNOD Trail, which was the first rails to trails program in the nation, is perhaps the best known of, of all the parks. And then one thing I want to highlight uh, for everybody is the establishment of the Fairfax County Park Authority. Uh, you might be saying, well, what, you know, what, what's the big deal about the Park Authority? Uh, this is the first Park Authority established under the 1950 Park Authorities Act by the Board of Supervisors in Fairfax. Uh, it establishes an adopted goal to reserve 15 acres of open land for every 1,000 residents. Uh, major parks today include places like uh, Lake Akatink and Burke Lake Park and Huntley Meadows and Lake Fairfax. Uh, you have a series of neighborhood and stream valley parks dotting the Fairfax County landscape. 
And today the park authority oversees 23,000 acres of parks. That's a little over 9% of the county is, is owned in public domain by this one park authority. You get additional amenities like Wolf Trap, which opens up in 1966, if any of you all have seen concerts there. It's the first national park for the performing arts. You get the establishment of a, of a major school system, tremendous growth uh, and recognition for Northern Virginia schools uh, occurring in the 1980s. And if you see the gentleman, the lower right-hand corner uh, with the glasses, that's W.T. Woodson, for whom Woodson High School is named. But by the 1980s, Fairfax County operates the largest bus fleet east of the Mississippi River. You also get the uh, Northern Virginia Community College, because Northern Virginians seeking college or professional education had to look to D.C. or suburban Maryland for universities and professional schools after World War II, and those schools had not been able to expand their facilities. So Northern Virginia Community College opens up its, its campus in 1967, later expands to six campuses across Northern Virginia. You also get George Mason University, which opens in 1950 as an extension of UVA. Uh, and in 1959, the town of Fairfax deeds 150-acre tract of land to UVA to establish a permanent home for George Mason College, which eventually grows to George Mason University uh, on 677 acres. Uh, the university obtained independent status in 1972. It's now the largest public research university in Virginia. Uh, it's got several other campuses. It's got the Patriot Center. It's got a variety of things, too. The 1950s were also an era of highways, um, and you get the 1956 uh, Highway Act, which, which most of us uh, obviously know about, but you basically are calling for wide, limited access highways that are favored, and government was pushing them to be built wherever possible. The Capitol Beltway opens up in 1964. It was originally envisioned as a bypass for travelers up and down the East Coast, but very quickly, we see changes in land use and, and property values and travel and shopping habits right next to the Beltway, and this, of course, adds uh, greatly to the traffic uh, and passenger growth um, uh, to the, uh, the the airports. You also get Interstate 66. This is an east-west link. The first section opens between Centerville and Gainesville uh, between 1964. Uh, it has you know three lanes to the Beltway by 1950. Uh, and of course, here is a picture of everybody's favorite parking lot, uh, I-66, uh, which is now going to be reimagined as a high occupancy toll lane, which is the way all of our highways up in Northern Virginia seem to be going. You also get Shirley Highway uh, being expanded south of Woodbridge. And if any of you all have traveled up to D.C., this is a little reminder of what the Occoquan uh, River crossing looked like heading from Prince William County into Fairfax County in 1983. And of course, here is what that same crossing kind of looks like today. It's kind of neat to think back to kind of a more rural time, even in 1983, uh, to see what has happened. But the important thing here is the HOV lanes. Uh, in 1951, uh, they constructed bus lanes in the middle of Shirley Highway. Uh, they were dedicated bus lanes. It was the very first place in the country to have dedicated bus lanes. And the experiment succeeded so well that this uh, became the very first area in the nation to use this method of high occupancy vehicle lanes uh, to have and encourage rush hour commuters to ride buses or commute rather than drive their cars. Um, so in 1970, the initial 11 miles of the reversible lanes opens from Springfield to D.C. And pay attention to the lower right-hand corner. This is a picture from the late 1960s of what is today Route 395. And you notice there's a train crossing, an accurate train crossing of I-395, and that's the Washington Old Dominion Trail, or Washington Old Dominion Railroad. Uh, and that accurate crossing would be eventually removed uh, when W and OD Trail goes out of business in 1968. But all across Northern Virginia, there are a variety for you know, beltways and beltways of beltways and bypasses around this and freeways here and there. Um, some of them get built, uh, but there's a variety of also growing pains, too, that prompt things like uh, zoning ordinances being adopted. Uh, this is the first zoning map from Fairfax County. And you see this tug and pull between rural landowners who want to monetize their property that they've lived on and newcomers in the eastern part of Northern Virginia that just want to have good quality schools and good quality roads uh, as well and these battles going back and forth. And you see this tug and pull, which is now legion for all of our city councils and boards of supervisors in Northern Virginia uh, of, of pro-growth, anti-growth uh, boards and city councils uh, that you see. So as we enter the 1970s, uh, growth continues to be directly attributable to the federal uh, employment expansion. Uh, you get major transportation improvements. Uh, shown here is what was originally called the mixing bowl. This is the, the Pentagon road network that we saw back in the 1940s. Uh, but this mixing bowl would become a notorious interchange and uh, would be eventually rebuilt in the 1970s uh, to construct numerous grade separated exit ramps and became the largest interchange complex in the world. It is a machine. 
Uh, you also get the advent and coming of Metrorail. Uh, construction of DC's first surface uh, rapid transit system and its first subway was begun in 1972 through an interstate compact between the district, Maryland, and Virginia. Um, it was a planning uh, experience and regional cooperation on a scale that had not before been attempted. Uh, but Roslyn opens up its first station in 1977 and Clarendon and Boston by 1979. And I'm showing this picture here because by the 1970s, Arlington Central Business Corridors, those trolley suburbs, uh, people were leaving. It was going into decline. And Arlington wanted to route uh, its metro lines uh, right through Roslyn and Boston and Virginia Square and Clarendon, right through the heart of its commercial um, areas to turn those into revitalized economic development engines. They come up with this bullseye concept, and it's almost like little mini cities around each of the stations. Um, and and this, is, uh, this is an under construction, Virginia Square under construction. Uh, we forget how much damage uh, this caused and how much consternation it caused. Um, but eventually, when it opens uh, in 1977 uh, in Northern Virginia, uh, it helps start, it starts to transform uh, those old commercial corridors into uh, a, a world-class, internationally recognized model for transit-oriented development. Uh, shown here is Boston. Uh, and if any of you guys have been and studied Arlington, uh, you know uh, how, uh, how they've done it. Uh, you know the growth that has occurred. And if you all remember my earlier comment about Arlington not going with the Bird Road Act, you can also see the different street sections and the payment of, of attention to, or the paying of attention uh, to pedestri the pedestrian realm in particular. Uh, but it is a, a, a large success story. And here it is looking westward um, from, uh, from Roslyn, uh, looking west. The skyline also changes. Uh, in 1972, uh, Charles E. Smith opens, uh, starts constructing Skyline Center. Uh, it includes eight apartment buildings, six office buildings, a hotel, and a shopping center. And when you're standing on the footsteps of the Capitol and you look west, you can see these buildings, these Spartan-like structures, uh, you know, sort of looming out in the distance. Uh, and it's just uh, absolutely massive. Springfield Mall opens in 1973 as an enclosed shopping mall. It gets closed in 2012 and it's being converted into a town center shopping center. Now it's reimagined as Springfield Town Center. Prince William County starts its march down I-95 uh, along the uh, along the I-95 corridor. Cecil D. Hilton begins beginning uh, begins building his Dale City on land west of I-95 south of Woodbridge in 1965. In one massive rezoning. The Prince William Board of County Supervisors grants Hilton the very first residential plan community uh, on 9,600 acres. 9,600 acres, that's 14.25 square miles, uh, and this becomes Dale City. Um, uh, today, 70,000 people live in this, um, you know, in this, in this subdivision uh, called, called Dale City. Uh, Lake Ridge starts in 1969, and today boasts 7,700 housing units. Uh, Lake Montclair uh, also uh, grows uh, as well. And here's a picture of Dale City in 1977, just to give you a, a sense for the growth. Uh, here's Montclair. Alexandria, uh, it's a wonderful, beautiful area now, been fully revitalized, uh, lots of historic rehabilitation. But, um, you know, back in the 1970s, it had, had seen sort of a decline. Uh, but Alexandria starts its uh, revitalization uh, in the early 1980s. Uh, with the uh, re renovation of the torpedo factory shown in the top uh, into an art center in 1983, uh, the development of the city's waterfront, and the opening of the Braddock Road and King Street Metro stations in 1983. So at both ends of Old Town, you've got these sort of anchors that are fusing the revitalization of downtown Alexandria. And this is the annexation map, the growth of Alexandria over time. Alexandria annexes in 1952 a bunch of land from uh, Fairfax County west of Quaker Lane. Uh, and when it annexed it, most everything in that annexed area, there, there wasn't much, um, but eventually you start seeing a lot of growth because of the proximity to Shirley Highway. Uh, and a little bit of trivia, uh, the city of Alexandria needed a new naming regime for all of its north-south streets, and it named them all after Confederate uh, officers. Uh, so uh, just a, at the very height of the Civil Rights Movement, you see sort of the, you know, <laughs> almost like a last backlash uh, of, of, of Southern rights. Uh, you see the, the, the naming of, of the north-south streets in Alexandria, which are shown here in pink. Van Dorn Street, Pickett Street, Beauregard, these names that we now uh, probably don't think twice of. Um, you also start seeing growth occur along Shirley Highway, like Southern Towers. Uh, you see Landmark Mall, which originally opened as a first shopping mall in the region to feature, feature three anchor stores. It would be enclosed in 1990 and uh, has now shut down because there are plans for redevelopment in the works. You get Fox Chase Apartments in the upper left-hand corner. You get the uh, world-class Radisson Mark Plaza Hotel opening up at uh, Seminary and Shirley Highway, uh, along with Mark Center, which is a 3 million square foot commercial complex. 
And then as we go into the 1980s, you start seeing new companies moving into the area. It's not just all federal companies. Uh, dynamic growth occurs with the first Fortune 500 company moving to uh, Northern Virginia in 1987, uh, and that's ExxonMobil. Um, it eventually moves out in, in 2014, has been purchased by Innova. Uh, but you get Freddie Mac moving to uh, Northern Virginia as well uh, in, in the 1990s. And then if there's one building that sort of shows the go-go building days and the, you know, the, the, power, the prowess of, of a region on the move, it's this building, uh, Tycon Tower, uh, also known as, as the sort of the shopping bag building. Uh, but it, it, more than anything, it's a postmodern building, all brick, but it shows sort of the economic prowess of, of this region. Uh, the National Automobile Dealers Association building opens up as well. Uh, and you also get Tyson's Galleria, also known as Tyson's Two, opening up right across the street from, from Tyson's Corner Mall. It's got the first Macy's, and today it's got Chanel and David Yerman. There is a Ritz-Carlton Hotel attached to it, along with two large office buildings uh, and, and quality food. Uh, you can get, you know, best cheesecake uh, factory there. Fairfax Square in the lower right-hand corner opens up in 1990, and this is a mixed-use complex located across from Tyson's One. It's clad in Brazilian granite, cobblestone courtyard, anchored by Tiffany's. Today has an Elizabeth Arden and a Hermes. Uh, it further cements Northern Virginia's position as the hottest retail cluster in the region, which is what is shown here with the, uh, the advertisements that the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority uh, provided. The 1980s also saw a lot of growth in the Fairfax Center area as we marched west on I-66. Fair Oaks Mall opens up in 1980, uh, but a lot of planning uh, and design went into what Fairfax Center would look like, the area around uh, Fair Oaks Mall. Uh, and if you go out there today, it's a lot of trees, a lot of leafy stuff, um, a lot of um, uh, uh, neat uh, garden style apartments. Uh, Fair Lakes opens up, which is shown here on 660 acres. Uh, but this is pretty much what, what Fairfax Center kind of evolved into and what it looks like today. And just like the Tycon Tower, was the big ubiquitous office building uh, that, that showed the economic prowess in Northern Virginia in the 1980s. Uh, the Fairfax County Government Center, shown here, almost like Brasilia rising out of the rainforest, the Fairfax County Government Center opens up in 1992. Uh, massive new building uh, opened up in the midst of the recession and was highly criticized for the amount of granite and marble and the amount of money uh, that, that went into this. Uh, but if you look at it, it is an impressive building. It was meant to be impressive from the beginning. Uh, but they had a gift shop and a lot of wood paneling and all sorts of things. Uh, and at the same time that Fairfax County was going suburban, uh, Loudoun County, shown in the upper left-hand corner, opens up its government center in the early 90s, and they choose to stay in the historic courthouse uh, and to go vertical as well. Um, here's the growth, the dynamic growth in the 1980s in Northern Virginia of the Fairfax Center area. You can see Fair Oaks Mall in the triangle. Uh, but this was it in 1982. This is it in 1985, and the new Fairfax County Parkway and a new interchange comes in. This is it in 2000, and of course, this is what it kind of looks like today. New planned communities pop up from Kingstown to Burke to Manchester Lakes uh, to, to Lansdowne. You see the, uh, yeah, here's, here's the new um, Kingstown Town Center. This is the Beulah Road Corridor in, in 1990 or 1980. This is what it looks like 10 years later. Just phenomenal, tremendous suburban growth. Uh, here is Fairview Park, uh, which is a, a, a place right along the Beltway with a lot of uh, high-end um, uh, commercial buildings and offices. And Reston Town Center, uh, going back to Bob Simon's original vision for a downtown, it opens up in 1988 with a Hyatt Regency Hotel and, and twin office buildings. Uh, but the growth of it's pretty phenomenal from 1990 to the eventual build out of it uh, in, in 2017. And of course, if you've been here today, it has won numerous awards as well. The Oak Hill area, uh, south of Herndon, uh, this is shown uh, in 1982. And again, just phenomenal growth, uh, you know, 15 years later. Lots and lots of, of new cul-de-sacs and homes. Franklin Farm, Sully Station 2, uh, hundreds of acres of, of, of housing. Centerville grows tremendously, boom. Centerville and Chantilly boom between 1989 and 1996. Here it is in 1980. This is what it looks like 10 years later. Overnight, uh, Little Rocky Run, Center Ridge, Sully Station 2, Trinity Center, all boom. Here's Chantilly in 1980. The evolution of Chantilly into this outer suburb occurs, and the growth is even more dramatic. Here it is 10 years later. Entire neighborhoods change uh, and get built there. Uh, the Route 28 uh, a corridor becomes this massive boom for industry. It uh, gets widened uh, in 1987, and you start seeing interchanges pop up, uh, and, and a special tax district is imposed. And you start seeing places like Dulles Corner and, and Westfield uh, pop up as well. And as I'm coming to the conclusion of 1 o'clock, I guess I'm not going to be able to get through 
uh, most of my other slides. Um, but you know, it's 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 just a remarkable region. Um, you know, as, as growth has occurred and and, and things have happened. Uh, and I wish I did have a, you know time to talk about uh, the booming of, of say Loudoun County uh, and and the rest of Prince William County and sort of the widening of I-66 inside the Beltway and, and all the interesting redevelopment stories that have occurred uh, really over the last 20 years uh, as we've sort of built out uh, what has occurred in Northern Virginia and we're kind of coming back to the idea of neo-traditional development and transit-oriented development because we've realized uh, as a region by and large that the greenfield era of development uh, is is pretty much over. Um, so with that, I'll kind of yield the floor back to Sarah. I'll be happy to answer any questions. If you're still awake and listening, uh, thank you very much for, um, uh, for, for your time. Thank you, Andrew. So um, as uh, I'll just wait a few seconds for some questions to come in. I do have one comment from Sarah Hussein. She says, no question. Just wanted to say this was super interesting and I wish it were the full two hours. Thank you very much for the interesting tour of transportation and development in Northern Virginia. Um, Thanks, sir. And then uh, another comment from Hillary Zom. Super interesting. Thank you. Um, and for those of you, if you want to send in questions, go ahead and type them in the questions box and we'll take a few minutes here to go over questions. Be on the lookout for a follow-up email coming from APA Virginia. It'll have the information to log your CM credit, to watch the recording of this webinar, and it will also have Andrew's contact information if you'd like to reach out about some of the things he talked about today. Um, we are looking for a way in the next, you know, maybe six months to be able to have Andrew present his entire two-hour presentation. So those of you who are looking for a little bit more, stay tuned. Alrighty, I have some questions coming in from, um, excuse my pronunciation, Haraner Rashid. Is there any quantitative study of these growths in Northern Virginia area? For example, a growth of urban footprints versus population growth. I'm sure that there is. Um, I, I don't have that um, at my fingertips, but you know, the, you know, I think you go to either uh, the George Mason Center for Regional Analysis keeps track on all that. Uh, Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments uh, would certainly have that information as well. Alrighty, another compliment. Wow, what a mastery of details and history. Bring Andrew back for part two. Thank you, Rich, Julie. Um, question from Kathy Lewis. Isn't it Beulah Street, not Beulah Road? It is Beulah Street. That's right. Yes, and Kathy, it's uh, two Beulahs, obviously. One in the lovely Hunter Mill District of Fairfax County, and then Beulah Street, the quarter I grew up on uh, in Lee District, uh, bordering on Mount Vernon District. You are correct. All righty. Thank you for that. And I will... Wait just a second. Oh, here's another question from Brent Krasner. With the phenomenal pace of growth, what may have been lost or could have been done better? I don't know. Hindsight's always 2020. Um, uh, you know, we look back on the planning decisions that were made, and we just say, you know, how did those people? I don't know. How did those people? How could those people approve something like that? You know, who made those decisions? But I think planning, like our profession, is um, you know, it's growth over time. And, and we learn over time, right? So, you know, what was true then, we were responding to, uh, you know, we were responding to the needs and the professed desires of people when, when, when the suburban uh, trend happened. And, um, you know, it's, it's no one's right, no one's wrong. Everyone's right, everyone's wrong. I mean, it's, you know, things evolve over time. I think, I think the good news is this region continues to grow and continues to, it serves as an economic engine that we still have the ability to revitalize these areas. There's still enough people coming here to warrant tearing down some of the things that you know are now sort of obsolete, and we have the ability to redevelop a lot of a lot of uh, this area and make them even more dynamic economic uh, engines. I think, and better places for people to live. All righty. Let's see. One more, another comment from Thomas Jordan. Thanks for the interesting discussion. I love the pictures. Being a planning growth history buff myself, I'd love to see the full presentation. I'll be on the lookout for a future announcement. Thank you, Thomas. And I believe that's it for the questions. Andrew, is there anything else you want to add before we hop off here? 
No, I, I guess the only other thing is, as I said at the outset, I'm proud to be a Northern Virginian. Um, I know that it's sort of seen as not being a part of the real Virginia, but I appreciate you, um, you know, I appreciate your, your, your time and, and just understand that we're, we're Virginians up here too. And, and a lot of the money that, that's flowing down to the rest of the Commonwealth uh, is generated up here. And um, uh, it's just neat to sort of present sort of what's happened up here. And I, I appreciate the opportunity. Well, thanks again, Andrew. Thanks again, everyone who joined us today to spend your lunch hour with APA Virginia. And we'll be on the lookout for more information on next month's webinar happening June 25th, and we'll send out that registration link. And I hope you all have a great rest of your Monday. Thanks for joining us.